hammer comes down and beats you over the head for the rest of your life with a big national security stick. And so that people learn to duck their head and not speak up because bad idea now. This is the emergency broadcast system. This is not a test. Repeat, this is not a test. Citizens are advised to take the following steps. Find us, armoroftruth.net. In the age of technocracy, scientism, and pop atheism, Greetings, Earthlings. Armor of Truth Live number 298. Take me to your leader. <laughs> it's trauma-based society time. That's maybe a little too jolly for the topic. Uh, welcome to the show, folks. Summer, good evening. Good evening. She's back with us. Back. For tonight's show. This is about, this is a topic that we talk about a lot, but we don't ever actually treat it as its own standalone topic and what we're getting into now is we're starting we've been uh, doing a lot of reading and research on who lucy Lucian tarnowski lucian tarnowski uh most of you probably don't know who he is but you will learn because it's important that we know who he is because he sort of is the leading the bleeding edge of the of the oneness movement and i mean in terms of global governance and how would you describe what Lucian does? I mean, it's it's sort of a well. He would he would say that his spiel is all about the up game and the gamification of life and getting people to uh, feel inspired and incentivized into uh, doing roles, doing skill sets. Yeah. So, and that, that's exactly right. And that's and this is what we're going to be talking to you about. Um, in our upcoming shows is the idea of pragmatic efficiency. It's also known as the, the technical attitude. This is you do what you must do to get what you want or to get the results you want. In a sense, this is it's Machiavellian and our whole society is like this. It's the logic of means and ends. Uh, techniques like, as Summer just said, gamification of society, uh, automatic queuing, and digital reputation systems right all of this is designed to keep us to keep our eyes glued to our screens it's also designed to engineer consent and that's the topic tonight is how mental health is killing us how our mental health is being engineered right the way public relations works today the bernaysification of society is they don't just sell you products that they think you need or that you do need. They use media and now social media and any and any other means they can to get to your brain. They create a desire in you. And through creating that desire in you, they already have a nice product ready to fulfill that desire that you now have that you never had before. So you buy products that you didn't know you need. And so this is what's happened in our mental health uh, industry. So we'll make the case tonight for why uh, mental health should be, uh, the concept of mental health should be eliminated. It should be scrapped. And this is based off of an article written by Theodore Dalrymple over at The Spectator. We've covered the uh, Theodore Dalrymple's work before here. He wrote a book called Romancing Opiates, dealing with uh, addiction specifically that addiction and and others where you don't you don't approach it as though you're a victim as though addiction came and attacked you 
No, you had to make choices to get involved with it. So that's kind of, you know, that's, that's kind of where we're headed. But ours is a society of exploitation by experts. And, you know, we'll also hear from Jim Carrey in just a moment on his, his descriptions of Jesus and how he says he found salvation through suffering. The reason I want to show you a clip from Jim Carrey is because he is the perfect example of how this whole ideal has been engineered into us. Exploitation by experts. And so through outright deception or willful ignorance, they're misleading people away from the truth about God. Now, that's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. First of all, Adam failed to disciple his wife. And then Satan took advantage of that. He, Satan appealed to the desire for better knowledge. And then Eve was easily deceived and misled because of that desire. Adam, as far as we know, he was standing right there with her when it happened. And Adam offered no rebuke, no correction that we know of. And so Adam willfully followed her into confusion and death. So you see how the hierarchy, the God's order got turned upside down. And when that happens, confusion and death. The deception is sometimes so subtle that good Christians are influenced and persuaded, just like Eve was, to question the clarity of God's revealed truth. And the rest of us are too slow or unsure how to respond and so we fail to rebuke and correct the error and therefore we play a role in allowing this confusion to proliferate so how do we respond how might you address these issues that we'll cover tonight even you know we've talked about the issue of christian nationalism as a as a weapon now how do you respond to that if and when it comes up you know somewhere in your life at church at home, at work. In other words, here's the question. How do we glorify Christ in our response to this vapid madness? And it is something that we should respond to. Here's one passage of scripture where an old apostle Paul is writing to his young protege in ministry, training him to deal with issues just like this. And it has to do with, uh, with suffering. We're looking at 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. We'll start there. Apostle Paul says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And that's pretty straightforward. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so that's the answer. That is the answer to every question. So we, we have to deal with how to apply it. How do we apply these things? All right, so let's start with this john rapaport uh, wrote a wrote a piece recently about uh he called the title is the new badge of courage i'm traumatized so let's see we'll come back to that piece in a minute i've got some i've got a few there we go i've got a few graphics for you too there's forrest gump one day for no particular reason we became offended by absolutely everything here's someone who's offended by everyone Who's not offended by everything? And then there's this concept, certainly. There is a big problem. When the world is offended by everything but sin.
let's go over here so you can see this article. Here's the uh, here's the article that we're talking about from uh, the, from the Hill that John Rappaport was referencing. There it is. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor recently was uh, she appeared at the University of California Berkeley School of Law, and she was asked, "How does she cope? How do you cope?" Justice Sotomayor, with when these consistently conservative uh, rulings, you know, come out of out of your your court, Sotomayor said, "Every loss truly traumatizes me." And then the crowd of about 13, uh, 1,300 students applauded. In recent years, the word trauma has been downgraded by psychologists, academics and whining liberals from a severe physical injury or extended period of shock from, for instance, exposure to horrific circumstances of war to, I'm triggered. That's trauma now. And anybody can be traumatized by anything. In fact, today it's common to hear, uh, for people to ask for and give trigger warnings. Here are some examples. Of, of what, what it sounds like when people say it. I stayed in bed for 12 straight days when I realized Trump was going to win the Republican nomination. So in that case, the trauma is a self-fulfilling story. The victim makes sure he's traumatized by staying in bed. Now we have the trauma that derives from a child being encouraged to identify with the opposite sex and then maybe they can't find a surgeon to do the job. Right around the corner, Rappaport says, if it, ha if, it, if it hasn't happened already, an elementary school teacher will have kids stand up in class and tell a story about some trauma they've endured. And so this is where we got the idea for the, uh, for the title of the show tonight, The Trauma-Based Society. Uh, here's another example. A secretary has a slip and fall accident at work. After she's treated by a doctor, her company tells her she's entitled to free therapy sessions, and she takes it. The therapist tells her that she has suffered a trauma. The secretary gets the message. She's supposed to endure a period of subpar functioning and recurrent fear. So, whether she has it, feels it or not, she invents it and she plays the role. Just like doctors, Psychologists and counselors are marketers. They find ways to promote new clients and extend their treatments. The medical industry today is not about cures. It's not about getting you to the end of your ailment. It's about creating lifetime uh, customers, lifetime patients. Am I right? That's right. Lifetime patients. Oh, I was going to. I went to the wrong graphic there. I wanted to we'd go back to this graphic right here. There. Psychological uh, science can help counter the spread of misinformation, says an APA report. The American Psychological Association wants more federal funding to curb online uh, misinformation. This is another way that psychological or that the medical industry is being used. Correct. Yeah, the medical industry is there to keep you coming back. It's uh, as well, you, you can just look around. I can see that particularly in North Carolina that yeah. the medical industrial complex is like the largest employer of most states now. I mean, you, it feels that way. Everything has got health UNC on it everywhere you go. Yeah, it's the biggest, yeah, no doubt. It is far too big, far too huge. Right, you know, and, an and we know that you know global governance will be happening through the platform of health and climate so those are those yeah, are two exactly of their right. appendages to to get that control that they're after yeah if, if if somebody didn't learn that in 2020 that that the uh the apparatus of the new world order in a big way as the world health organization is trying to do right now take over ultimately it's through fear through creating fear they you know again as we said they create they create a reaction in you. This is the old problem reaction solution uh, method, right? They create 
a crisis or they create a desire or a drive or an urge in you and then they have a whole industry ready to uh, capitalize on it there's always a movement to demand that demands respect right for these for the new meanings of these words and failure to show re this respect results in being canceled it results in exile and excommunication just ask for example reparations committees across america a person living in, in chicago in 2024 is by proxy according to this system still suffering the effects uh, the, of the, on his ancestors who were slaves and so if that if that uh, if the if the black man in chicago happens to say yeah my, my great grandfather was uh, was a slave in the south but today i own my own business i'm doing well i don't need reparations well today that man is betraying his people uh, he's got some crazy idea about honoring success and there's there's no such thing as success in this movement. There's only justice uh, in the form of cash or reparations. As it says here, efficiency is the fact. Justice is just a slogan. And so being offended has become um, an art form. Uh, we shared this the other day. Roger Scruton pointed out an example of how this taking offense, this <clears throat> being of, so we'll be talking about being offended and suffering and how all of this has sort of been engineered into us. And this has come through the concept of mental health. Roger Scruton uh, writes uh, that ignorant, malicious people have discovered a new weapon in their unremitting assault on the rest of us. That is the art of being offended. There are now experts in the art of taking offense. Indeed, whole academic subjects such as gender studies that are devoted to it. We've encountered a new kind of predatory censorship. This was our last show was about the idea of this predatory censorship, specifically the term Christian nationalism is it's a predatory term. It's a, it's a weapon, but this is uh, this new censorship, predatory censorship is a desire to take offense that patrols the world looking for opportunities to be offended without knowing in advance where it's going to come from. You're just looking for something that will offend you. Scruton says, I recall the extraordinary case of Boris Johnson and the burqa in the course of discussing the question whether the full facial covering should be banned in the UK. You just, he just asked the question. Well, it, there's political advantage, political mileage to taking offense, and so at once, offense was taken. MPs and public figures fell over each other in the rush to display their shock and distress that our Muslim fellow citizens should have been so grievously offended. And so virtue signaling became the order of the day. A kind of hysterical fear swept away all the important considerations and debate so that everyone, friend and foe alike, ran for shelter we're not guilty was the collective cry of the time servers and wimps that govern the uk but scruton says this we in western culture we live in a face-to-face -face society where strangers look each other in the eye we address each other directly and take responsibility for what 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 is said what we say to each other it's a it's a custom it's not just a fashion and it's deeply implanted in us by a thousand year old uh, religious and and religious and legal tradition he says i certainly do feel awkward in the presence of such people and suspect that they are actually abusing the trust that we spontaneously extend to strangers No sensitive person, however ignorant, however ignorant you may be of the Muslim faith, would fail to take his shoes off when you enter a mosque. Not because he feared the reaction of the worshipers, but because he knew that there is a long-standing custom and tradition there that requires it, a long-standing religious 
custom, even a legal tradition there that requires it. And that not to observe that custom is to show disrespect for a sacred place. But somehow, we're supposed to forget that principle when it comes to long-standing customs of our own. For us, too, there are sacred spaces, and the public square is one of them. It is the space that belongs to others. It doesn't belong to you. So when we consider those who refuse to accept this, we're supposed to think that the entitlement to take offense rests entirely with them, and the tendency to give offense rests entirely with us. The art of taking offense might be a profitable business, to the experts, but it is a huge loss for everyone else. And the, re the, the reason that this has come about now, we're arguing that it is, it is because obviously of social engineering, and in this case specifically, it's the concept of mental health that's killing us. So we'll make the case now from uh, Theodore Dalrymple uh, that the concept of mental health should be scrapped. Summer, are you, uh, is anything, I'm just checking in with you to see if I skipped over anything that you wanted to add there. Mm. No, not at all, actually. Okay. All right. <clears throat> all right, we'll get around to it. Okay, so let's jump into this section. Now, who can prove whether or not, well, if, if someone calls out from work and they say they feel depressed or, or anxious, uh, they're grief stricken and they're unable to work. Who is able to actually distinguish whether they're telling the truth or not? Who can distinguish between can't, want, and would rather not? It's a fact today. Now, this article is from the perspective of the, the UK, which is, this, this would be similar here. It may even be worse here. People in their early 20s are now more likely to be out of work than people in their, er, than their, uh, in their early 40s. And the reason, in the UK, they use the term, I've got mental health. You know, I guess that, as Dalrymple says, once one even hears people nowadays say that I've got mental health, not meaning something positive, but something negative. Mental health means something bad. It means that you're incapacitated. So those with mental health issues, or in the UK, just plain mental health, can get by economically without working today. But the truth is, the way we're made, the way the Lord knitted us in the womb, we don't like to feel useless to others. We, we inherently know that there's something wrong with that. But if you play the part long enough, after all, it is what you become because habit changes character. What is mental health? Unfortunately, it's come to mean any deviance from a state of perfect equanimity and satisfaction. So anytime you feel the least bit offended or if you're suffering in the least, now you're experiencing mental health issue. Dalrymple says, a long time ago, I noticed that the word unhappy had disappeared from the everyday lexicon in favor of the word depressed. If you can claim to be depressed, then you pass the responsibility over to professionals, experts who are expected to do something to you or for you that will remove the depression just the same as if a diseased appendix was being removed. You can jump in anytime if you get a if, if you just get a moment of inspiration just Right on. Let me know. I will. Because I, I just, I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm You're on a roll. Yeah, this is a great article, and I just found this when I was researching for the last show. And um, in other words, the idea is that depression has become fashionable now. Just kind of like. Well, it's also very indulgent. You know, people oh yeah, just. Yeah, that's a good point. It, it's normalized, and, and people go constantly to therapy. And so that's why this has come up is like, should we really be going to therapy? Um, people realize that when they when they keep rehashing their traumas, they actually get worse. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's not good. And thing. they traumatize the therapist, apparently, too. I've seen writing on that. Hmm. 
the therapists themselves become traumatized by the people that they're trying to help. Well, you know why? It's because they, we've, we've well, you've read about that. I, the other day I was reading about how there were many, a lot, a lot of therapists, even ones who were just out of college and just started working, who are quitting because they can't help anyone. Mm. They haven't been equipped to help anyone and the kind of trauma, which is not really trauma that comes in, is not something that can ever be cured. It can't be helped. We need a savior. <laughs> ah. I think so. Yes, exactly. So depression is the new fashion, just like, you know, being gay is fashionable. Being mm -hmm. trans is fashionable now. So depression sort of came before. It came, it sort of led, led the way on that. And what we're saying here is that there was a, there was a, there was a supply created and then the public came in and filled the demand just the opposite of the way the market should work. Psychiatrist Colin Brewer formulated uh, a, a sort of quasi law, and it says that misery increases to meet the means available for its alleviation. So as people see opportunities to be treated for certain things, they, seem, they tend to find, you know, when you see, you know, if you watch network news these days, network news, especially Fox News, is funded by pharmaceutical industry. So mm -hmm. you see constant pharmaceutical ads. Right. Constant. And yeah. they're telling you about all these diseases and these people look so happy. I, maybe I have that. Maybe I should have that, whatever that element is. You know, with, it's, it's- With their laundry list of side effects, of course. The marketing of disease. I mean, it's really strange. Um, this is a deeper concept that we won't get into now, but we will as we move forward in this topic, as we talk more about uh, oneness, Christ consciousness, and how that, how uh, Lucian Tarnowski's mo movement is really using that. Well, uh, they want to promote this idea that you're going to be sovereign, that the self so, will, yeah, yeah, what's that you'll term? have you'll, time sovereignty. Right. And, and that self you're gonna sovereignty. Be, yeah, you're going to have sovereignty through this new digital matrix that they're bringing online and just how, what an, a magical thing that they do with the language to obfuscate the, the the glaring obvious fact that really this is about servitude this is about being in some sort of slavery learning matrix. to love your servitude yes and the brave new rapture the brave <laughs> new rapture yeah so there are, there's an idea here about how grace is achieved about how grace happens and in the in the secular sense and in the uh, pagan sense in the false religion sense we have to do something. We have to offer some sacrifice before grace can be can be dispensed to us by the gods or 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 the the doctor. And so this all this is how public relations works. The logic of means and ends to create a demand in the people. Uh, it's no different than sorcery. Um, or or the ancient uh, sophist, who is like a like a lawyer who boasts that for it's just like a lawyer or the uh the, the talking head on the the news channel they'll boast that for an appropriate sum of money he can convince people of anything of any proposition through the potent spell of his personal eloquence of his ability to be persuasive uh, the secular version of the principle is expressed as you might hear no pain no gain uh, god helps those who help themselves it's a uh, performance to prize. This is the default setting in human beings. It's the default mode of our society. You do what you must to get what you want. Uh, Jacques Ellul uh, called this technique. The totality of methods rationally arrived at and having absolute efficiency in every field of human activity. He said, it's never anything but a collection of means and the search for the most efficient uh, means. The collection of means and the search for the most efficient means. You can see this story in, uh, it this, this urge in humanity, this default setting of humanity. You can see its origin in, in Cain's city building. You can see it in Lamech's uh, polygamy. We'll talk more about that later as well. It's called the technical attitude, a way of approaching the whole of life from the point of view of technique. 
um, optimization, efficiency, and ensuring outcomes. So the marketer already knows about how many people are going to take that vaccine. They already know about how many people are going to take that pill before they ever start marketing it to the people. They know just about how many people are going to say they are going to come into their doctor saying they have these symptoms because they already, they're programming it into the people. Everything as a potential instrument to greater efficiency. People, these people not only see the substances as the means or the propaganda as the means, they see life itself as a means to an end. Bonhoeffer called it the mechanization uh, of life. Getting people to support ideas and programs, engineering consent, as Bernays called it. And so they'll tell you that it's for your good, right? That, the, the cons that consumers are making these choices because we're informing them and their choices are voluntary. But this is another form of the noble lie. A machine fully capable of creating desire and then delivering it to its intended goal. So they're creating demand. And, in, and by this, they're using the latest in psychological research to create desires by targeting consumers subconscious impulses this is magic this is why we you know we 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 hear so often pharmakia where our word pharmacy or pharmaceuticals comes from um which is a term pharmakia a term that translates to sorcery creating desires by targeting consumers subconscious impulses uh, magic is the perfection of a technique. Every magical means, in the eyes of those who use it, is the most efficient one. It subordinates the power of the gods to men and secures a predetermined result. So this is, this is what modern marketing does. It proliferates from the corporate world even into the state, into the government, and that's really what we talked about in the last show is how you see this in news and in and in government but the concept of mental health Dalrymple says i once calculated that if you look through the diagnostic and, and statistical manual of the american psychiatric association fifth edition you would conclude that the average citizen in the western world suffered from two and a half mental disorders every year it's normal it's just who we are we are we are we are mental health we are mental uh, mental illness let's see yeah let's let's go to let's go to Forrest Gump for a minute <laughs> a generation ago it was multiple it was uh, multiple personality if you can remember uh, 20 30 years ago you know the um, three faces of Eve kind of thing and the DSM-5 suggested that the prevalence might be as high as one and a half or 1.5% of the adult population that has multiple personality. Every 66 people, in other words, at that time. Now, what's happened? Well, multiple personality has since become uh, very rare. You don't hear that mentioned. There are other things. Now you're, now you're transgender or something, something else. These days, though, it could be gender dysphoria. That's become fashionable. Uh, with child gender identity referrals in the UK increasing from 210 per year in 2011 to over 5,000 a year in 2021. That's amazing. That's a 10-year period. We're dealing with a socio-psychological epidemic. Now, he says here, and, and this is a good disclaimer, we're not denying that there is real mental illness. There are real disorders. He, as Dalrymple says, there is real madness. And physical illness may present with uh, psychological symptom, uh, symptomatology straight out of the DSM-5. But this overlap does not explain the vast increase in diagnosis of psychiatric disorders among the young. Nor do we say that there... Um, nor do we deny that there are many reasons for the young to be dissatisfied or anxious. Clearly, there are many reasons in this world today to be dissatisfied and anxious about the future because of instability of family life, 
uncertainty uh, uh, for economic prospects. Are you going to be able to get a job? Are you going to be able to support yourself? There are reasons to be anxious. But no army of nurses, uh, psychologists, therapists, or doctors are going to improve those matters. On the contrary, it will dig a pit from which it will be difficult for these young people to escape from. The ever-expanding gamut of psychiatric diagnosis encourages the belief that all departure from a desired state of mind is a medical condition susceptible to some medical or some other technical solution. Pragmatic efficiency. This results in a propensity for hypochondria. Hypochondria of the mind. With people taking their mental temperatures, as it were, as hypochondriacs take their blood pressure. But it precludes honesty or genuine reflection and leads to the search for bogus cures of bogus diseases. You might see one corollary here is the neglect of those who genuinely do need help, who genuinely require care, and who also drown in a sea of inflated need. I think that's the that's the strongest line there. There's a desired, there's a, an inflated desire for need. How did he say it again? They're drowning in a sea of inflated need. So, suffering. It seems like that uh, today, again, mental health or mental illness has been redefined to be anything or depression anything that upsets my routine anything that's out of the ordinary that that bothers me that feels wrong that feels out of order and we talked about uh supreme court justice sotomayor saying that not only does she feel frustrated so she says in the article she feels traumatized by the conservative uh, rulings in her court. We'll talk about this in an upcoming show. Uh, back in uh, 2012, Facebook did their mood manipulation experiments. And uh, th that's, that's techne. That's the, uh, that's the technical attitude. That's the pragmatic efficiency. They're creating, or they were, they were experimenting on how to create certain desires see, about, see how people would react if they if they cultivated their news feeds in a certain way part of uh, ongoing research companies do to test different products and that was what it was a poorly communicated said sandberg the, one of the executives at the time they hid a small percentage of emotional words from people's news feed without their knowledge to test what effect it had on the statuses of their likes that they then posted so they could keep an eye on you know how they responded so this brings us around to uh the concept of suffering and we've got here uh jim carrey let's listen to what jim carrey says about suffering and this is relevant because this uh this idea of mental health that we are arguing is killing us has caused a lot of people to, as we said, to identify suffering as anything that's out of the ordinary. Now, I don't know, I don't know the, I don't know the context of Jim Carrey's suffering. That's not what this is about. I just want you to listen to how he talks about suffering and what he says about Jesus and consciousness and uh, all of that. Here we go. The energy that surrounds Jesus is electric. I don't know if Jesus is real. I don't know if he lived. I don't know what he means. But the paintings of Jesus are really my desire to convey Christ consciousness. I wanted you to have the feeling when you looked in his eyes that he was accepting of who you are. I wanted him to be able to stare at you and heal you from the painting. You can find every race in the face of Jesus. And I think that's how every race imagines Jesus. They imagine him as their own. And uh, ultimately, I believe that suffering leads to salvation. And in fact, it's the only way. 
that uh, we have to somehow accept and not deny, but feel our suffering and feel our losses. And, uh, and then we make one of two decisions. We either decide to go through the gate of resentment, which leads to vengeance, which leads to self-harm, which leads to harm to others, or we go through the gate of forgiveness, which leads to grace. And uh, your being here is an indication that you've made that decision already. You've made the decision to walk through the gate of forgiveness to grace, just as Christ did on the cross. He suffered terribly, and he was broken by it to the point of doubt and a feeling of absolute abandonment, which all of you felt. And uh, then there was a decision to be made. And the decision was to look upon the people who were causing that suffering, or the situation that was causing that suffering, with compassion and with forgiveness. And that's what opens the gates of heaven for all of us. So I wish that for all of you. I wish that for myself. I know that you know, no matter what I've suffered, most of you have suffered worse than that. But that's why I admire you, because you're here. You know, and you will have grace because this decision has been made. So I'm so glad to be with you and uh, to be a part of this. Thank you, Father Greg. Thank you, John. He said, Thank you, Father Greg, there. Um, Episcopal, probably, Southern. <laughs> probably Episcopalian, a Roman Catholic. Well, let me just, uh, there's, there's a lot there. We're, we're not really here t tonight to. To, to get in to refute everything Jim said there because there's a lot of problems there. You you cannot forgive yourself. That is a lie right from the mouth of Satan himself. You can't forgive yourself. You don't have that power, that ability. And as you can see, the urge, the urge here, and it, Jim Carrey is reflecting an awful lot of our society today. The, the, the urge there is to get away from suffering as fast as possible and the way you do that is by forgiving those who are causing your pain and well how should we look at suffering what should how should we look at this this you know we, we're being we're being compelled to depression being programmed to it romans eight eighteen says i consider that our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us Psalm 35, 30, verse 5 says, For his anger is fleeting, but his favor lasts a lifetime. This is, this is the true grace. Weeping may stay the night, but joy comes in the morning. So th this is less about trying to be the forgiver and forgive yourself. And this is more about endurance. Consider it all a joy, my brothers, when you encounter various different kinds of trials knowing knowing that these these trials are for a purpose your suffering is doing something okay but what this causes here's another short clip he may say most of the same things but i i want we the reason we want to show this is because we've been programmed to this depression we've been programmed into this idea that that my suffering is the greatest uh, injustice in the world and where does that lead people it leads people into what jim carrey is is out here advocating which is christ consciousness which is a which is uh uh it's oneness it's basically it's oneness it's uh eastern mysticism it's not salvation you can't get to salvation through suffering Let's listen to this piece here. I think he says more about this here. Your being here is an indication that you've made that decision already. You've made the decision to walk through the gate of forgiveness to grace, just as Christ did on the cross. He suffered terribly, 
and he was broken by it to the point. So it's the same thing, but here, here's where we have to stop and make this point. Christ didn't suffer on the cross so that you wouldn't have to suffer. He didn't suffer on the cross so that we could look at his suffering on the cross and somehow be able to forgive ourselves and to forgive those. He suffered on the cross for the, for the atonement of, those, of, of the sins of those who would believe. He suffered on the cross as, a, as an atonement, as the path, as the perfect and last sacrifice for sins. He suffered on the cross so that you wouldn't have to stand before God alone on that day so that you wouldn't have to experience eternal conscious torment. He died on the cross to, for the sins of those who would believe in him. And it's, it's not the Christ that, Jesus, that Jim is talking about here. This, this is a different Christ. This is a different idea altogether. But where does this lead people? It leads people into mindfulness. Isn't that right, Summer? There's that, the idea of um, the, the New Age, the New Age stuff, the New Age doctrines, mm -hmm. the New Age. And, and one, of the main <clears throat> one of the main places people end up when you get into New Age, I know I, I, I experienced it. I went right into it because I'm look, I was looking for answers. I was looking for ways to transcend the ways to to deal with why i felt bad or why i didn't experience the joy i thought i should be experiencing but what about that cure because the the medical industry and uh corporations places uh you know if you've gotten a job recently or if, you, or if you're working now you you may notice that on your uh that that yoga and meditation have become have become options in your in your health care plan. They have become strongly recommended. Yeah, there's treatments. These are treatments, and and why not? Because it's certainly not going to cure you of anything. And that's what this was about. Uh, let's give credit to. Uh, well, and it's uh, also dangerous because just doing the poses of yoga is. A dangerous endeavor spiritually it opens doorways to demonic oppression yeah, it's the poses uh mantras mantras reciting the names of uh hindu hindu gods which would be uh, if they exist at all would be demons and yeah you're opening yourself up to all kinds of problems and this is what this is what i want to show you just specifically we won't go too far into new age and stuff or yoga here tonight we, I've got a video on the channel called uh, The Danger of Yoga and Meditation. You can see it. I'll play a little clip from it here tonight. But uh, credit to Stephen Bankars for the work he's done on exposing this. But what does mindfulness? It's just, this is what Jim Carrey wants to teach you to do, to be mindful, you know, to sit with your thoughts and let them come and to empty yourself. Let me just say right now, that's the absolute opposite of the real answer. The real answer is, is to be in Christ and to be filled. It's to be filled with the Holy Spirit, not to be emptied so that any wandering spirit can find its way in. So this, uh, there was a study done uh, back in, uh, published in 2017 on the negative uh, effects of meditation led by Dr. Willoughby Britton, professor of psychiatry and human behavior at Brown University. The study sought to document what kind of negative side effects regular meditators experienced during the practice. The study uh, sought to document how severe and how frequent and how long lasting these negative side effects were. 60 people were selected to participate in the study. Each of them, each of these people selected, had at least 18 years of experience in meditation. Theravada Zen, Tibetan Buddhist traditions. They also had to be exempt of having any unusual psychological experiences in their past that could mimic the symptoms they may report during med meditation. What was interesting about the study is just how long these participants had been meditating for. Sometimes it's asserted that if people 
have bad experiences doing yoga or meditation or any new age practice, it's because they're inexperienced and they just don't know what they're doing. They're not fully initiated yet. They're just being uncareful and they lack the proper training. But in this study, 43% of the participants they interview had meditated for 10,000 hours or more, while another 49% meditated between 1,000 hours and 10,000 hours. Not only this, but 60% of the participants were meditation teachers. These people were literal experts. These were also educated people, only two of the 60 lacked college degrees and 67% of them had a master's degree or higher. So these were experienced, educated people. And what they were interviewed for was challenging, difficult or distressing experiences they experienced during meditation, which is often a part of a yoga practice. And so here's a breakdown of the findings. And remember, it comes from people who are educated in Buddhist meditation traditions and have put in all of this time. 82% reported fear, anxiety, panic, and paranoia. The, the thing is, folks, you don't ever hear this reported. All you hear about yoga and meditation is it is, the, it is the thing. This is what you ought to be doing. This is gonna help you feel better. It's gonna help you deal with the anxiety of the world. 82% fear, anxiety, panic, and paranoia. 57% reported depression, dysphoria, or grief. 50% reported social impairment, delusional, irrational, or paranormal beliefs, physical pain, occupational impairment. 30% reported feeling rage, anger, or aggression, sleep disorders. A quarter of the people reported self-conscious emotions and in and insecurity that that would be something like a repetitive negative thoughts about yourself 25 percent reported loss of sense of personal agency they lost the sense of who they were 23 percent reported agitation and irritability 22 percent headaches or head pressure 20 percent fatigue and weakness 18 percent felt uh, it's i don't you know there you go Seems like every time we bring up that word, the video gets buried. 18% reported uh, abolition, which is a lack of motivation and initiative. 17% reported emotional detachment. And another 17% said they experienced something so severe that it required hospitalization. 17%. Right? Out, of, out of 60 people, that's, that's, uh, that's well, that's more than 12. No, that's, uh, that would be about, that would be about 10 or 11 out of the 60 people had to be hospitalized. Now, if you're skeptical of this, you might say, sure, everyone has problems when they first start meditating because they've never done it before. But these things work themselves out over time. You just keep at it. It'll go away. But these effects were not caused by inexperience. Remember, these were experienced people. Only 18% reported challenges uh, during the first 50 hours. 29% uh, reported challenges in the first year, 45% challenges between years one and 10. Most of the side effects came about with regular long-term practice. The study actually found that the more someone practices and studies mindfulness traditions, the worse their experience will be. There's the, here's the study, the actual study itself. It was meditated, meditation related experiences. Why? That, because it's self-indulgent and they need the savior. Mm. Yes, yeah, like Jim said there, he's sending people to a false savior. There is no savior. You you can't find a savior in your own suffering. Isn't that sort of uh isn't that sort of the Buddhist tradition? You know, the idea to to uh empty, your, mi empty your mind and be to detached. embrace the suffering uh, that that uh, that all of reality be is suffering and detachment. Yeah, detachment. Ultimate detachment. That's the goal, yeah ultimate detachment this is um the, the study investigated meditation related experiences that are typically underreported. right that's the big deal here these things are not reported because that's because 
yoga, meditation, and these new age, these mindfulness practices are a $2 billion a year industry. So they control, this is, they're very astute in public relations. They know how to handle their reputation, right? They do, and this is leading people to this one world religion. No doubt. Here's a story from The Guardian. Same thing, is mindfulness hurting us? Claire, 37 year old in a highly competitive industry was sent on a three day mindfulness course with colleagues as part of her training program for work. She said she found it relaxing at first, kind of zoned out within two or three hours of later sessions, I was starting to really, really panic. The sessions resurfaced memories of her traumatic childhood and she experienced a series of panic attacks. She said somehow the course triggered things I had previously gotten over. She says, I had a breakdown and spent three months in a psychiatric unit. It was a depressive breakdown with psychotic elements related to the trauma and sev uh, several dissociative episodes. Now, Summer, what's important, what's important there about dissociation? Uh, in the well, that's how it makes you vulnerable and susceptible to the solution that they have waiting exactly. for you. That's right. And this is also what happens to young people today who are on social media and who are receiving yeah. this transgender programming, the right. dissociating from their bodies. That's like, right. To, so they see it as raw material to be changed, mm -hmm. yeah. And one can argue as well, I mean, they've, they've made this, they've used clinical language and they've used, you know, these scientific terms, if you will, but what's actually happening on a spiritual level with this person, because they did do those practices of emptying the mind and the visualization, and uh, maybe they held the different poses and they're invoking, uh, it's a spiritual war that they're in. Yeah, exactly, that's so, the point, yeah. Yeah, well said. Another story uh, prompted, uh, uh, well, this was one person in the article, uh, prompted Farias to look further into adverse effects. Louise, a woman in her 50s who had been practicing yoga for 20 years, went away to a meditation retreat. While meditating, she felt dissociated from herself and became worried, dismissing it as a routine side effect of meditation. Uh, Louise continued with the exercise. The following day after returning home, her body felt completely numb and she didn't want to get out of the bed. Her husband took her to the doctor who referred her to a psychiatrist. For the next 15 years, she was treated for psychotic depression. Now, Claire up here said she also, uh, she spent, she four years later, she's still in and out of hospitals. Some of the research that they looked into of unexpected side effects, a 1992 study by David Shapiro, a professor at the University of California, Irvine, found that 63% of the group studied who had varying degrees of experience in meditation and had each tried mindfulness had suffered at least one negative effect from meditation retreats, while 7% reported a profoundly adverse effect, including panic, depression, pain, and anxiety. This was a small scale study. Uh, Several research papers, including a 2011 study by Duke University in North Carolina, have raised concerns about the lack of quality research on the impact of mindfulness, specifically the lack of controlled studies. And so that's what they got in the 2017 study that we just shared with you was more, more evidence. I'll share another one right quick. Rachel, a 34-year-old uh, filmmaker from London, experimented with mindfulness. An old school friend had tried it and attempted to warn her off of it. He said, it's hardcore. You'll go through things you don't want to go through and it might not always be positive. I suppose sitting with yourself is hard, especially when you're in a place where you don't really like yourself. Meditation can't fix anyone. That's not what it's for. After a few months following guided meditations and feeling increasingly anxious, Rachel had what she describes as a meltdown. Well, you know, because the whole focus is all about you, right? You're just it's self indulgence. It's the soul searching the self, and you're just ruminating hmm. on your own thoughts and trying to control your own thoughts, and then believing that your thoughts create reality. Yeah. And if something's neg <laughs> negative is happening, then that must be your fault because you manifested it into your reality. So there's also the shame and the guilt that comes from this too that you know i'm i'm trying to manifest a positive outcome here and nothing positive is happening and i'm feeling worse and worse and oh my gosh i'm doing this to myself 
Yeah. So it's this awful feedback loop. Yeah, it's true. It's it's uh, the the big thing here is what you're talking about is self indulgence. You're 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 wrapped up in your own thoughts and your own ideas. It's so this is the process. This is what the world tells you is that you need to go in. You need to go with it. Yeah, you must love yourself. The answers you don't, are you there. You don't love yourself. You must love yourself. Listen to uh, here on uh, actualized. Uh, dot org. I'll play a couple clips. Of this he just tells you exactly what what it's what it's about. Here's here's what you should do, and I'll tell you what. I'll show. Play another clip after this. Listen to this. No manipulation means that you don't manipulate your body or your posture. You just let it go natural, and whatever it wants to do, let it do it. This includes your mind. So let your mind go natural too. So if you're so, on what's Jeremiah seventeen nine say? Just you don't don't have to look it up the heart oh yes the heart is desperately so, wicked yeah that's it that's the idea so is do, you, do we think it's a really good idea just to let to let your mind go where it wants to go does that sound like a good idea no we're well, supposed to renew our mind yeah. with the word stay in the word meditate yeah. on the word of god yeah uh romans 12 2 be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind mm -hmm. so that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that means that, you know, this is not about emptying yourself. It's not mm -hmm. about letting your thoughts go. This is an active practice. Let's see. Let's listen to, listen to these parts here. Did he say the part about perverted thoughts already? Yeah. Mind wants to think perverted thoughts. Let it think perverted thoughts. And if it wants to yeah. judge, let it judge. And if it wants to go crazy and get angry and upset and all this, let it do that. And if it wants to experience some emotion, like sadness or happiness or excitement or frustration, let it experience that emotion. Whatever's occurring for you, don't try to experience anything because you already are experiencing. There's never a moment when you're not experiencing, unless maybe when you're deep asleep. But if you're awake, then there's never a moment you don't have an experience. So that's it. Your meditation is focused on that, this right now, this right now experience right here. Okay. So he invites people to practice right here. Now, here's the, uh, here's a blast from the past. Who's that guy? Yeah. And it's like, you know, indulge your emotions. Cause what could go wrong with that? Exactly. Exactly. What could go wrong? Let's, let's, let's take a quick look at that while he, Let's take a look at that right through Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17, 9 says the heart, and that, that means the mind. That means your thoughts. That means yourself is deceitful above all things. It's not to be trusted. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick this is these are the this is the the effect the ravages of sin on in this case the mind now sin has caused the whole world to fall it's caused our minds to fall and our bodies are fallen but in this case it's talking about the mind your thoughts yourself your heart yourself your mind your thoughts your desires are deceitful they will fool you they will lie to you desperately sick who can understand it? You can't even really understand the depths of your own wickedness. But verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. You might ask in that case, well, what in the world? What is the point? What's the hope after all that? The hope, the point is, as Summer just said so well, right here. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, include your mind, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. Yeah, that's the truth. Now, listen to this little piece right here, too. This is, 
How old is this video? I can't even remember when this is. This is February 12th, 2020. This is a blast from the past that nobody can see. There we go. There's actualize.org. This channel has almost 1 million subscribers. And here are some of the quotes. Let's see, I think what they've got now. Yeah, one, one uh, they've picked up another 100,000 or so, 1.11 million now. So here's, uh, here's an old Brad from Carolina as he's finding his way <laughs> around in this medium. From a video he made called The Dark Side of Meditation. Uh, some of the things people can expect from their meditation practice. Expect depression and meaninglessness to wash over you. Uh, I can almost guarantee that if you're going to meditate for longer than a year, that you will be hit by some serious spells of depression. <laughs> also expect suicidal thoughts. I can almost guarantee that if you are meditating effectively, you will have more suicidal <clears throat> thoughts than you've probably ever had in your life. So, jump right in. Both feet. And that's if you're a normal person. I'm not talking about <laughs> suicidal people. I'm talking about totally normal people. Don't we even have to be suicidal, my friends. If you take up this practice, this is what an expert meditation teacher has to say for you. Me, from my meditation habit, uh, I never have really suicidal thoughts. But from my meditation habit alone, uh, the more I meditate, the more suicidal thoughts I have. And that's totally fine. Hmm. I recognize that. I don't take them very seriously. And um, you don't take them. Therefore, very they don't bother me. <laughs> but someone who's not expecting that could get freaked out by that and could actually maybe <laughs> think that they're going to uh, take action on it. Expect some freak out moments. Some days you just start to freak out and you're not even sure why. Turn back to old habits that you've worked through already. You might go start doing drugs again or alcohol or smoking cigarettes. Expect traumatic memories to resurface, perhaps. Stuff that you have completely forgotten about, stuff you might think you've worked through. It's going to be some traumatic stuff, especially if you had traumas in your childhood, stuff that you've repressed, stuff that was very negative, maybe examples like abuse, sexual abuse. Okay, so the, we'll jump back in here now. So the assumption there is that repression is bad. Right, it's you shouldn't repress these thoughts. If you have perverted thoughts, just let them come, let them happen. If you have thoughts of harming yourself, just let them happen. Did you see? He was, and he wasn't joyous, but it, it was, he was a little smile on his face when he was talking about mm -hmm. that. You know, is that it's not that big a deal. Look how that's just silly. I, some people might even harm themselves. It's kind of like it, I, pff, mm -hmm. big deal. You know, I mean, the concern, right? Yeah. For this practice that he teaches, that offers uh, no real solution and as we can see the science you know the science it's complete says it's that complete self-obsession yes it is and it is. very sad honestly well the westminster confession of faith and the london baptist confession both and the first question that they uh that they that they answer they both affirm that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Now, that's what we learn in Scripture is that th this is our purpose, to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Not to embrace your suffering, not to forgive yourself. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, where, uh, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Let's pull this up here for you. There it is. Yeah, so whether you uh, eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. This, is, this verse encapsulates the principle that every aspect of human life, even the most mundane actions, is an opportunity to honor God. In our suffering, if you've heard on our mobile app, uh, the Bible study in the James series that we've got started there, we've got four episodes. And it's... We're not even out of the first chapter. We're not even halfway through the first chapter because those first, those first uh, 15 verses are, it's everything about suffering and about how to deal with trials and, and temptations. 
Uh, Paul's exhortation to the Corinthians underlines the totality of the commitment to glorifying God in all things, highlighting the purpose of human existence as fundamentally relational and directed toward God's glory. That's the purpose of human existence is to have a relationship with God. It's not to empty yourself and do mindfulness. Psalm 73 uh, 25 and 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So the psalmist here is expressing the desire for God. And I, and I would submit to you that you don't have that desire for God in you naturally. That's the natural man. Our natural condition is sinful. So you heard actualize.org there saying to you, let it happen. Let it be natural. Who's speaking to you there? I would submit to you that that's not just a man speaking to you there. That would be your adversary speaking directly to you through that man, because that's the worst advice possible. Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. The chief end of man is not found in self-actualization. It's not found in the pursuit of an impersonal state of consciousness, but in the fulfilling of the purpose for which we were made, and that is to glorify God and to enjoy Him. Not for a little while, not for the rest of this life, but forever. Revelation 4 uh, 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So these are, these are the, the creatures surrounding God's throne in, in John's vision of heaven here. And they are proclaiming his worthiness to receive glory, highlighting the created order's purpose, even, even the created order, even... even uh, the natural world is created to honor God. And so this is the future. This is a future-oriented vision of worship and adoration that encapsulates the eternal aspect of enjoying God, suggesting that humanity's ultimate fulfillment lies in participating in this eternal glorification with God that comes in the future. Can you call up 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10? Absolutely. 2 Corinthians well, here we are. We were here in, oh, that's 1 Corinthians. Let's go. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. All right. 2 Cor 9. There we go. 2 Corinthians 9, 10, and 12. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. Gotcha. <laughs> Bradley is dyslexic. The third time is the charm. <laughs> Bradley is dyslexic, so. I, that's okay. Okay. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 9 through 10. There we go. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. This is the Apostle Paul talking about the thorn that was given to him in his flesh. A messenger of Satan to harass Paul, to keep him from being conceited, to keep him humble. Your suffering might be present in your life for that reason. You might be an extremely prideful person over here. Over sure. here, over here, sure. hi, guilty. <laughs> so, so you might have a thorn in your flesh. You might have something. Uh, you might have a, a certain kind of suffering, and it's there to keep your pride under. It's there for the glory of God. This is not how the world thinks. Paul prayed three times and pleaded with the Lord about this to take it away. God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And so God, uh, uh, Paul says, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It's only the Holy Spirit that can give you that kind of perspective because that, that doesn't come from the world. We're not taught that in the world. Right, Excellent. and so for Thanks the for sake that. of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What's the, what's the major word right there with what we're dealing with tonight? 
right? With uh, being offended and sufferings, and it's content. Uh, eudikeo, that, uh, I'm not trying to get into the Greek scholars, I'm not one, but this is an easy one, right? This is, this, the, the context of this word is, is good, is good. I am good. I'm okay with it. I'm happy with weaknesses. Uh, it's uh, pleasure, right? This is what uh, uh, what is in First uh, Corinthians, Second First Corinthians, uh, the Eudikeo of my dilemma. It's uh, God's the pleasure, the good pleasure of His pleasure of His good will, the good will of His good pleasure. That's what the word means, though. I'm I find contentment. I find that it's good. Well, this is what uh, this is what we see in in uh, James. Count it all a joy when we encounter trials and suffering. There it is. Uh, James, the servant of God. Yeah, verse two. Count it all a joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials or trials of various kinds, because you know that this testing, this is testing of your faith. It's not just testing for no reason. It's it's testing it's proving what this word means it's, it's not it's not just trying to see how firm you are or how faithful you are testing in the sense of proving right to, to be proving improving your faith it produces steadfastness or perseverance it makes you stronger and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing So uh, Matthew 11 also, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. This is the word of, this is, this is Jesus speaking. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Um, where do you, do you find a promise any better than that? Can you find a promise anywhere close to that in the world, in, in all of these solutions that, that people have for you? Philippians 1, verse 27, standing firm in one spirit with one mind, contending together for the faith of the gospel. Okay, so this is our community. This is what we do as Christians together, as the body of Christ. Verse 28, in no way alarmed or bothered or, or, or afraid or frightened by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. So in that persecution, when you feel attacked, if you feel certain sufferings from the world, understand what it means. Verse 29, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake only to believe in him, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his sake. Did you hear that? For you, it has been granted. In other words, this is your privilege. Here's your privilege. Not only that you believe in him, which you've been granted, but also it's your privilege. It's your gift to suffer for his sake. Having the same struggle which you saw in me, said Paul, and now here to be in me. 1 Peter 3, 8. Um, verses 8 through 22. I don't know if we need to read it all, but get the general idea. Finally, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, affectionate, compassionate, and humble. Here's your charge. So as a Christian, you know, we wanted to tell you how to deal with this. That was the question at the top of the show is what do we do? Uh, how do we respond? How do we manage the fact that this is all around us and we're being affected by it too. All of you be harmonious, sympathetic, affectionate, and compassionate, and humble. Do not return evil for, uh, evil for evil or insult for insult, but instead bless others because you were called to inherit a blessing. For the one who wants to love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from uttering deceit, and he must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it for the eyes of the lord are upon the righteous and his ears are upon or open to their prayer but the lord's face is against those who do evil who is going to harm you if you're devoted to what is good 
In fact, if you happen to suffer for doing what is right, then you will be blessed. But don't be shaken. Don't be terrified. Don't be worried. But set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer. Sorry, I didn't keep up with you. There we go. This is the section we were headed for right here. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks about the hope you possess. What's the reason for the hope that is in you? Yet respond, do it with courtesy and respect, gentleness and respect, meekness, keeping a good conscience so that those who slander your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame when they accuse you because it's better to suffer for doing good if God wills it than to suffer for doing evil because Christ also suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, to bring you to God by being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. In it, he went and preached to the spirits in prison after they were disobedient long ago when God patiently waited in the days of Noah as an ark was being constructed. In the ark, a few, that is eight souls, were delivered through water. And this prefigured baptism, which now saves you, not the washing off of physical dirt, but the pledge of a good conscience to God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who went into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers subject to him. We see it also in Ecclesiastes 3. Summer, there's one of Summer's favorites. Ecclesiastes 3, 11. But we see here in the first eight verses that there is a time, there is a season for every matter. A time to laugh, a time to weep, a time to kill, a time to heal time to be born, a time to die. There's a time for war. There's a time to speak. There's a time to be silent. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has made everything beautiful in this time. Also, he put eternity in man's heart. Yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. It's curious, right? Our need for grace is constant, but our ability to provide it for ourselves, our, our ability to provide grace for anyone to, to another person is extremely limited. Any grace we're able to provide is either a gift of God's common grace or his direct, his, uh, or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us. This is why people who don't believe people who hate christ are still able to do good things this is god's grace is common grace and we're all painfully aware of our limitations and believers and unbelievers alike we all know that we're limited that we struggle everyone knows that this life is precious that it's something to be honored and protected and likewise every human heart meaning the will, the intellect, and the mind, knows that we're all responsible for the way we live our lives. This is the gospel, my friends. This is how you begin it, to help someone understand that you're fallen, you're a sinner, you're a rebel against God's laws. Every human soul has a God-given awareness of this, that there is something beyond the material world Billions of dollars are spent every year on the pursuit of higher consciousness, meditation, yoga, mysticism, Wicca, ghost hunters. Thousands of religions are built on the knowledge that we all carry that there must be something more. Ecclesiastes 3 affirms the idea that humans are fundamentally different from all other creatures. We have a sense of eternity in our lives. We possess an innate knowledge that there is something more to life than what we can see and experience in the here and now. And so God in his infinite grace and wisdom has placed this knowledge in every human heart. And those who love God and walk with Christ in obedience to all that he has commanded will find satisfaction and peace in knowing that while this life is fleeting, 
and there are sufferings and the world is full of evil, we'll have eternity to live in the perfect beauty of a restored creation with God and all of our family in Christ. The reward comes after. Salvation is now, but also not yet. Seasons come and go, but for the unbeliever, does anything in this life truly satisfy? You can see the offers. You can see the options that you've been given by the world. Does it look like that any of that stuff is ever going to truly satisfy? It's all vanity, Ecclesiastes 1-2. All is vanity in this world. Happiness is fleeting. Pleasure just causes us to seek more pleasure until pleasure becomes a vice that kills us. Trying to live your best life now only leads to self-deception, as Summer said so well earlier. It is, it is to be consumed with yourself. It is a self-delusion. You can't fill yourself with enough experiences and worldly pleasures to satisfy your soul. Even if God was to answer all of your requests, you'd still have one more and one more. Emptiness is inevitable apart from Christ. But even the unbeliever who suppresses the truth written on his heart can still sense that there's more beyond this world. God has set in the human heart eternity. James 4.14 says, life is but a vapor, but we know there is something past this life. We have a divinely implanted awareness that the soul lives forever, that this world is not our home. And to deny it, to suppress that truth and unrighteousness is the worst kind of sin. There is nothing on earth that can fully satisfy a man or a woman intellectually or practically. Our security is not in this world. Our security is in the eternal God who has made it. And as such, we reconcile all things to him because it's all for his purpose, for his glory. In Ecclesiastes 3.14, you see three features of God's grace and his purpose. God's actions are permanent. It shall be forever. God's actions are effective and complete. Nothing can be added to it. God's actions are totally secure. Nothing can be taken from it. We will have troubles in this life. But as Jesus said, we can take heart because he has overcome the world. God's grace gives us an appropriate fear of God. Not as if God were a dreadful monster or some unknown force that's inexplicable, but a reverence and a respect for his righteousness. The world has meaning. Because God will judge the heart and the deeds of man. The world has meaning because the world has order. And where there is order, there must be justice. And every heart knows that. And on the day of judgment, every knee will bow and call him fair, just, righteous, and holy. The only difference is that some will do it in shame on their way to hell. Romans 14, 11 says, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All of this is inscribed on the conscience of every human being. All are without excuse. There is more, and our conscience is always proclaiming that truth to us. That's what this search for meaning in the world is all about. None of us can live up to the demands of our own conscience, let alone the demands that God has given and the demands that we know in our hearts. Romans 1, 19 and 20. That which is known about God is evident within them, for God has made it evident to them so that they are without excuse. God knew that sin would lead to disobedience and disobedience to a fallen mind with a darkened intellect and a selfish desire for sensuality. All good things come from God. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Even the unbelievers capable of producing these fruits 
Because God's grace is everywhere at all times, providing, sustaining, restraining, convicting, comforting, loving. James 1.17 says, Every good thing and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, coming down from God who never changes. But in our hearts, we reject God and suppress this life-giving truth. Romans 1.32, although they know that rebels against God deserve death, they rebel even harder and enthusiastically encourage and celebrate others who rebel and sin with them. Real obedience, even though imperfect, is only made possible through the work of Christ for all who believe in Him. God does all the work of regenerating the heart of rebellion into a heart that not only knows the commandments of God, but loves them. That's the true test of salvation. Do you love God's command? That's the truth of having the law written on our hearts according to the new covenant. And evangelism and apologetics and just daily living around other human beings, it's vital. Very important to know this truth. We're speaking to people who already have knowledge of God written on their hearts. Nobody's neutral. None. Nobody. That person either loves God or hates God. It's one or the other. God has placed profound truths and knowledge of right and wrong in the hearts of every human being. We are to make use of that knowledge in other people and appeal to their conscience, appeal to their knowledge of right and wrong, and tell them about their condition, and tell them about the Savior, tell them about their God, and then He will use us to build His kingdom. That, that, is saving grace and that is the point not self-actualization not to embrace uh, your suffering and yourself summer romans eight twenty eight. yeah there you go and we know that for those who love god all things work together for good all things work together for good for those who love god so that's a great way to end it right there. Let's drop the mic right there. Thank you, my friends, for joining us. You got anything to say to the folks on the way out? No. I'd just like to remind everyone to please, if you would, download the Armor of Truth mobile app so you can get live notifications and know when we go live, where we go live. In case it's not here, you'll get notifications of new articles, which we should have one out very soon for you here. And uh, if you can support us, um, you'll find links under this video. You'll find uh, a Give tab on the Armor of Truth mobile app. We need you more than ever. Because as you can see, we don't, well, YouTube isn't gonna be supporting us or allowing us to, to make our way here. And that's, that's just fine. We'd rather that not be the case. We'd rather be supported uh, by you. And we are. So we thank you for all that. And if you can, uh, if you can support us, there are plenty of ways for you to do that. Armoroftruth.net forward slash donate and the links under this video. That's right. I'm Brad, and this is my precious. Well, how does I've got it here? She's precious <laughs> and lovely, talented, precious, talented and precious <laughs> wife. I wanted to get it right. And uh, together, uh, we're Armor of Truth, and we're seeking a worldview revolution through God's revelation. Faith is resistance. God bless you, my friends. See you next time. God bless you guys. Thank you. <laughs> The hammer comes down and beats you over the head for the rest of your life with a big national security stick. And so that people learn to duck their head and not speak up because bad idea now. This is the emergency broadcast system. This is not a test. Repeat, this is not a test. Citizens are advised to take the following steps. Find us, armoroftruth.net. In the age of technology, Scientists and pop atheists. Faith is resistance. Nietzsche, of course, announced the death of God and called for the birth of the Ubermensch, the Superman.
Truth YouTube channel. This is not a test. Repeat, this is not a test.